Read our live. Okay. Well, you need to hit continue, I think. Ah. Or at least it's still showing that on my screen. It's it's actually you, John. It's asking you to make oh. sure you're okay with the recording. Oh, well, how about that? Thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> well, I'd like to go ahead and call us to order then. Um, let's see. Mrs. Marshall, do you want to do a roll call for us? No, it's yes. an executive meeting. Um, Mr. Page of Charles City is not here. Miss Bailey of Chesterfield, not here. Mr. Wright Goochland. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Dr. Rayleigh Goochland. Yep, I'm here. Mr. Axel Hanover, not here. Um, Reverend Cooper of Henrico. Hey, you're on mute, Reverend Cooper. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Highslip. Here. Thank you. Ms. Hall. Here. Thank you. Ms. Barber. Here. Thank you. And Mr. Pritchett. Here. Thank you. Ms. Ayers Powtan, not here. Ms. Andrews, Prince George, not here. And Ms. White of Richmond, not here. Okay, great. Thank you, Mrs. Marshall. So uh, let's see. Board members, is there any need to amend or add anything to our agenda? If, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, do I have a second? Second. Second. Great, thank you. We've got several of those. So all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thanks so very aye. much. Aye. Now we know what we're doing. Uh, we have the minutes and board members, uh, these have been presented to you for some time. I assume you've had an opportunity to review them. Is there any need to change what's there? And if not, I'll uh, accept a, or, uh, a motion. I move that we accept the minutes as presented. Thank you, Ms. Hall. I have a second. I'll second. Mr. Pritchett, thank you so very much. We've got a motion and a second. Board members, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. So, Dr. Lowry, we've got no recognitions, I see, but uh, uh, um, the next thing on our agenda is a public comments. Uh, board members, Mrs. Marshall circulated the public comments yesterday. I assume you've had an opportunity to review them related uh, from an alumni who was uh, in support of the cultural study that was done and uh, of the continued uh, focus on our uh, improvement of our admissions process. So um, I assume you've had an opportunity to review all of that. Uh, so now, Dr. Lowry, sorry. That's fine. Right. Right, you know, you would think after a year of this, I'd be I'd be uh, more adept at Zoom, but I want to make sure. Are you able to see right now? Do you see the picture of our seniors? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, okay, I've got this. I got it set up right today. <laughs> At our very last virtual meeting before we go back to in person, <laughs> I finally got it right. Um, so, <clears throat> what I usually do on our last meeting is kind of give a summary of our of our senior class that we're graduating in about eight hours. Um, we're really excited about that. And so they had a picnic uh, a couple of weeks ago, and most of them showed up to it. Most of them were able to make it. They all wore their shirts that they, uh, um, in, in terms of where the college is that they're going to. So you can see that there's pretty good mix there. And here's kind of a summary. And, you know, as, as crazy and challenging a year as it was, we actually, we actually did pretty well. We actually did pretty well with these seniors. Uh, and I'm not going to read every single little piece there, but you can see that as a class, they earned at least $14.7 million in uh, scholarships. And of course, that continues to grow as we get more information in. Average grade point average is there. The SAT and the ACT scores are noteworthy because um, given a strange year, you would think that they might be affected, but our SAT average score was 1422, and that's actually up 10 points from last year. And the ACT average, <coughs> excuse me, was 32. And that's actually up one point from last year. So for whatever standardized tests are worth, uh, our kids were do, did a little better this year than they've done in the past. 
We got 62 different colleges that they're attending. 120 of them are staying in state. 64 kids are going out of state. Three of them are going to colleges outside the United States. And one of them is joining the United States Marine Corps. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, and six students are planning on taking the gap year. I'm actually kind of surprised that it's not more than six, all things considered. But uh, six, years, six students are taking the gap year and doing some traveling. We had 10 National Merit finalists this year, 44 of them that received commendations, and three of them actually received National Merit scholarships. And that's a uh, pretty pretty significant as well. Two of them were presidential scholars. Um, you know, in total, they were recognized for 396 different honors, awards, and scholarships. So despite the fact that the vast majority of our senior class chose to remain virtual for the balance of the year, they did, they did very well. And as we're kind of emerging from this, this mess, I think they've got some really bright futures ahead of them and are, are taking advantage of it. So I think we weathered the storm academically anyway, fairly well with our kids. And I'm really proud of the, the students, the senior class, the, the teachers and faculty and staff that, that contributed to this. And hopefully we'll have a nice celebration this afternoon to kind of see this group off. We're still working on our VHSL awards and such, but we did have some regional championships, some state runner-ups. I just got this thing sent to me a couple days ago where our kids uh, in film, which is something we hadn't participated in much, uh, received the audience choice for a public service announcement commercial that they did. So VHSL was very, very good to us this year. And again, the track is still track is still ongoing. Uh, the tennis, both boys and girls tennis were regional or were state runner-ups. Um, we had regional championships all over the place. So we made the transition from class two to class three pretty well. Um, all things considered that we were able to make that adjustment, which I think was something that concerned a lot of people, you know, when you're the largest school in one class and now you're one of the smallest schools in the next one, but our kids still did real well. And we're looking forward to uh, being able to get full seasons underway uh, in August. Uh, just a quick update on summer building activities. It's the usual, we are gonna re-wax all the floors, uh, upgrade some technology pieces. We're working on replacing our uh, security camera system because it is very old and no longer supported uh, by any software that's out there. So one by one, as these cameras kind of die, we're losing that coverage that we need. So uh, we're using some, some capital money to be able to take care of that that was left over from some of the CARES money. So we're, we're, in, we're in good shape on that. Freshman boot camp uh, we'll be doing in August for some of our students, students that we kind of recognize might need just a little bit extra support to make that transition to Maggie Walker. And then college boot camp is also in August, and that's where we work with our seniors. Uh, and by the time they're done with the boot camp, they'll have the common application completed and be ready to start applying for colleges. And both of those will be live in-person events in August. Uh, and then, of course, the big one is reopening of school. You know, it's it's. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be a challenging thing for us, not in a bad way at all. I mean, let me, let me be real clear on that. I'm ex, I'm extraordinarily excited about bringing us back full time five days a week, um, but there's going to have to be a little bit of some growth, you know, a little bit of a growing curve with that. I was at a PTA meeting the other night, sort of the end of year culmination that was hosted in the PTSA president's house, and there were probably about 30 people there, sort of packed into two rooms. And I'm fully vaccinated, and I have no fear of of COVID right now. But it's the first time I had been in a room with 30 people that tight. And it, it was kind of a bit of a psychological thing. And then we did our senior night um, two nights ago and the auditorium was full. And everyone was masked up because we're still required to mask inside, but the auditorium was full. And that's the first time I'd seen that in a year and a half. And it was just kind of a, a bit of a, you know, a little psychological hit to you. Um, you know, as you almost, almost like, I guess it must, almost felt almost claustrophobic to me. So there's gonna be a little bit of a, an adjustment as we bring kids back on campus and go from having you know a couple hundred on campus every day to 760 some every day. But we're really excited about it. Um, you know, We're all gonna take a little bit of time off this summer to kind of recharge the batteries, so to speak. But I, I can't wait. I mean, the first day of school is gonna be like the 4th of July and every other major holiday rolled into one. And we're, we're gonna make it as exciting and welcoming as possible for our kids, especially our new kids. And we're also looping back and picking up some of the traditions that some of our kids missed. So our sophomores next year, this year's freshmen, will get their lock-in in the fall that they missed this year. Um, we're going to do the Junior Book Awards for our seniors in September so that they'll get that recognition that they missed this year as well. Uh, and then we're just going to kind of 
spool back up on all of the big traditions that we have, the fall festival, the field days, pep rallies, all that type of stuff. And God willing, and uh, things don't go terribly bad for us this summer, we should be back to a state of something that looks a little bit more familiar than what we've had for the past year and a half. Uh, and I think I probably speak for everybody on this call that, that it's, it's incredibly exciting. And I, and I hope that as we start taking on these things again, that we don't look at them as burdens and that we, you know, oh, I have to do a pep rally this afternoon, that we really appreciate what it was like when we didn't have those things. Um, and that's, that's something that I'm really looking forward to. So all in all, you know, as, as crazy year as a year that it was, we, we came out in good shape. We, we survived it. We did all right. We only had one confirmed case after we reopened on March uh, 15th. Only one confirmed case from a student, and I think we mitigated it real well, and we're, we're ready to get back into business. So that is my, my verbal update for right now, but I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of what we were able to do this year. Great. So uh, let's see, you've, you've uh, hit the verbal updates here. Yep. You're going to get coming events. And yep, I'll go and roll through all this, uh, all of these events here real quickly. And then uh, Wendy DeGroat's going to present from the library and uh, school advisory just logged on to the call. So we're good there too. Uh, coming events, of course, the big one is graduation this afternoon. And then uh, last day for teachers uh, is Monday, but some of them can check out tomorrow if they're able to get things done. Um, and then uh, we kind of start rolling into the cleanup phase for this year. So those are the main coming events. And then uh, I did talk a little bit about um, things that we're doing in the early fall with the boot camp as well as the college kickoff. One new requirement that we have uh, is a annual field trip report to the board. And I'm gonna click on that real quick. Obviously things were virtual this year, but you can see there the list of field trips that we had, some of more competitions. Um, we were able to go out to uh, a couple live events. You know, the outdoor club went to Hollywood Cemetery. Photography class went to Rudy Inlet down in Virginia Beach, as well as James River State Park. Um, the uh, baseball seminar went to the African American History Museum in Washington a couple weeks ago uh, to study uh, primary documents. Um, but most of the, you know, everything that we pretty much did was either outside or if it was very recently as things opened up, we were able to take a, a field trip up to Washington, D.C. So that's our field trip report and it's submitted for your um, review. And the uh, next item I have is the, let me click out all these things so I can, the next item I have is our foundation approved our enhancement grant for next year. The total is $169,650. And you can see how that's broken down there. Teacher, it's about 30,000. The foundation's gonna give us for conferences, which we hope we'll actually be able to start going to again, uh, as well as tuition for our, some of our new teachers to get their gifted endorsement. And then the bulk of the money, 139650 is going to uh, the students, whether it's uh, supporting instructional enhancement, clubs and teams, student aid is a big one, being able to help kids pay fees. Uh, we all, as I've always said, the foundation, you know, their, their primary mission is to make sure that every kid that, that earns the privilege to attend Maggie Walker is able to attend it without any kind of financial problems in terms of being able to participate in everything that we do. So uh, the foundation's been very generous in their support of us. And then the next item I have, and this is kind of an interesting, well, actually, I guess I need to go ahead and, uh, Wendy, I'm sorry, on my, uh, I jumped the gun there a little bit. That's okay, Wendy. do you want to do the, you, you, you <laughs> no, 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 I, I would jump, I jumped the gun like by, by three agenda items. So you are, okay. <laughs> you are, you are up now. Um, Wendy DeGroote is our librarian and she's going to provide a little bit of an update as to what we've been doing in the library. Um, and I would like to just take this moment real quickly uh, to just publicly thank her for all that she's done over the past 15 months, really, of course, the past however many years she's been here. But um, Wendy is one of those types of people that, that sees things that I don't see. And I think that's one of the things that makes this team that we have here at Maggie Walker so effective is that we have a really diverse group of people who have different perspectives on things. And Wendy latched on very, very, very quickly. And I mean, like, days after we went out in 2020, that there would be an emotional cost to what we were doing, particularly with our younger kids and being connected to the school. And she immediately developed uh, programs for the kids to connect with each other, to connect with the school, to engage in what she called Walker Wednesdays. Um, 
and 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 kids participated. Lots of kids participated on these things that had nothing really directly to do with the academic program, but to stay part of the community and to build that community. And it's something that in the in the craziness of the beginning of the pandemic, I never it never would have hit my my tunnel vision as to what we needed to do. Um, she takes the initiative to do things that go far above and beyond what any one would ever expect of any person with a title of librarian. Um, and I don't mean that to be disrespectful librarians. I'm just saying she she takes her role at the school so much deeper than what she's, uh, you know, her job description would be. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, but just I just wanted to publicly thank her for everything that she's done and helping us get through the past year and a half. Thank you, Dr. Lauer. I really appreciate it. Good morning, board members. Um, Dr. Lauer, do you want to stop sharing your screen? I sure do. Okay, super. So um, what I wanted a chance to do today um, was to give you an update on kind of what the library has been doing in this virtual time. And Dr. Lowry gave you a bit of a preview and I, we've talked a little bit about um, some things over the year, but just so this is a sort of a year long retrospective. So I wanna talk about it in four different areas. Um, and that is the online library engagement in regard to supporting student research success, offering community service opportunities, which is one of the things that Dr. Lowry was referring to just now, fostering a sense of belonging and community, um, and then teaching mindfulness strategies to students and parents, which thankfully I was still able to continue doing in the virtual environment. Um, in terms of teaching consults and collaboration, these are some of the areas where I was able to um, still support uh, students' research success. Um, because of the time constraints, a few research projects um, that I helped with um, were not you know, done this past year, but many of them were. And I was also able to do some really fun team consultations with math modeling and individual consults with Polar Palooza Seminar. And then obviously lots of other individual consults, consult, excuse me, from students who had different kinds of assignments all around the, the school. Um, but these are some of the key supports that I provided. And then one of the best barometers of kind of how research activity is going in the school for us is our use of one of our most popular databases, which is JSTOR. And it's a scholarly archive um, of journal articles across disciplines. And what you can see here on this chart is the blue line is last school year and the orange line is this school year. So you can see that the patterns were a little different and that our usage was down a bit. It was down about 25%, but we still had um, over uh, about 10,000 downloads by the end of May. And that means students actually selecting and downloading a particular scholarly journal article to support, or, or a teacher, of course, doing it too, um, to support some work that they're doing. So I just offer this as um, something other than anecdotal evidence to show you that um, research was still going on in a, in a pretty robust fashion um, here at Maggie Walker, as I imagine you expected, but here's the data to back that up. In terms of community service, there were a number of forms that that took this past year. Um, Walker Wednesdays, the thing that Dr. Lowry mentioned was what I led off with, which was a, a building uh, uh, in, out of the Giving um, Together Tuesdays that we did last year. Um, we extended that with a holiday cheer project, um, went kind of uh, hybrid with that, with walk away on my schedule where kids could do it on their own time individually instead of with a group. Um, we had some kids complete the Veterans History Project and then one small step. So I wanna talk just briefly about each of these things. So Walker Wednesdays, um, again, an expansion of Giving Back Together Tuesdays in the spring of last year. Um, these were 31 90 minute sessions between the week before school started and the end of May. Um, and each started with a discussion spark that was meant to foster student connections by getting them talking to each other about different things and providing them with a spark so that they didn't have to figure out what to say to a stranger. Um, and then in response to student feedback, I broadened the organizations they could work for um, to include some additional organizations, the National Archives and the Smithsonian. Um, and then the walk away on my schedule um, we had some students who could not attend Walker Wednesdays because of sports practice and different things who asked if they could do it on their own and document it um, another way. And so we figured that out. And then when campus reopened, we shifted the time so that it could continue and people could continue earning service. 
And then finally, in May, we had yet another iteration. Um, leaders of our period club, who you'll hear about a little bit more later today, um, made uplifting postcards for inclusion and feminine hygiene kits. And they became part of Walker Wednesday and kind of were in their own breakout room. So it was just kind of cool how this evolved over the course of the year. Um, you can see that these are the organizations who benefited from the students' work. So they did expand quite a bit over last year's um, Giving Together um, Tuesdays. This is an example of the groups that would gather. So you can see that they also grew in number over the ones I showed you last year. Um, and these are the kinds of cards that they and letters they were sending to members of the Virginia Home, or residents, excuse me, of the Virginia Home. And over the course of the year, 109 students contributed 1,400 hours of community service um, during Walker Wednesdays alone. So not even counting those other activities. The top 10, I think, give you a sense of how many divisions. This really touched students in across our divisions that we serve here at Maggie Walker. Um, rural, suburban, urban, you know, all of them were participating. Um, and you can see that some of our students earned even more than their annual requirement um, during just this one activity. Holiday of Cheer, um, they extended their card making activities to making decorations and cards for residents of the Virginia home. Here are some of their decorations. And then walk away on my schedule, we would use Google Drive and they would take screenshots to verify the work that they were doing. So you can see that this particular student, Ayamade, who's one of our seniors graduating this year, um, she was transcribing in the Mary McLeod Bethune collection, um, which is really cool. Our Veterans History Project, which is an oral history project from the American Folklife Center. We had um, four students complete oral histories of veterans in their lives. Um, and those are being sent to the um, American Folklife Center for permanent inclusion in their archive, which is very exciting. Um, and that was a really neat experience. There were four workshops that they attended to get them ready for that experience. And then they scheduled it on their own time, um, whatever worked for them schedule wise, as long as it was done um, by the end of May. In terms of fostering belonging, this relates, as you know, to our first goal of our strategic plan. And there were a number of ways that that happened. Those discussions spark at, sparks at Walker Wednesdays, but also some future friends, lunchtime gatherings for freshmen at the beginning of the year, Friday fun activities, virtual watch parties for the drive-in movie night when kids couldn't, some kids didn't feel comfortable attending that or couldn't. Um, and then um, Dr. Garrett Scott and the One Small Step conversations. These are just two examples of those discussion sparks. So you know, sometimes they were funny, like designing a monster that was around Halloween or getting to know each other. Um, they might have, another one that they were asked was um, ways that they were being a rainbow um, to their peers, friends, family, and neighbors based on the quote from Maya Angelou, have, how have you been a rainbow in someone else's cloud? Um, we also had some fun with doing face paint and you know tiaras and stuff, hats and so forth for Halloween. And this is Dr. Shanette Garrett Scott telling us about Maggie Walker um, based on her research for her book, Banking on Freedom. So just kind of helping with overall identity. That was an evening program for the community parents and students. One Small Step is the other major program that I wanna talk about. And that happened toward the end of this year. It started in February. Um, it is a project of StoryCorps and it is meant to help people get past the labels of Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, and really sit down and have a conversation with someone whose political viewpoints are different and get to understand why they hold those views rather than spending your whole time listening um, to them, hypothetically listening, and really just thinking about what you wanna say in response to rebut what they're saying. So really teaching them a different kind of being with that kind of conversation. Um, so they were paired with a person who had a different perspective than them politically, and they were um, talking about questions like the ones you see here on your screen. And these, again, were conversations not about debating or persuading. Our kids learn that here too, um, but this is not what the, that was for. It was about really who they are and, and what they believe and, and sharing and finding common humanity and really listening with respect. We in Trinity Episcopal were the first high schools in the nation to offer this program. Um, and in case you're wondering who participated, we had 40 student participants who represented Democrats, Libertarians, Republicans, and politically unaffiliated. Um, they were in urban, rural, and suburban districts. Almost half of them were freshmen, and 45% were students of color. This is the progression it um, went through. They did self-reflection and preparation. They did four workshops with me um, to get ready. They had a practice round, then they did their dragon to dragon round, and then they did the round with Trinity, 
And then they might this summer, some of them talk to somebody who, for whom it's a high stakes conversation, somebody they really care about now that they've had some practice. The four workshops covered these topics. So we went from self-awareness and centering to sort of news blind spots and civil discourse. We had some active listening practice and then talked about what to do if things drifted off course. This was one of their favorite activities, which I encourage each of you to do too. So you take a, you write down your three core values. They're the trunk of the tree. The branches are your viewpoints. And then the roots are what leads to those viewpoints. You know, what relationships, teachings, tenets of faith make you believe or support the things that are on the branches. So many of them learned a lot about themselves um, through that activity. This was the timeline we followed. I did learn that that was too late to start. <laughs> Having things happening in May, the, half, the second half of May, not a good idea. So I will adjust that in the future. Um, but it was a really, really rewarding experience. Um, this particular interview with Pooja and Elizabeth was one that was shared publicly um, because they chose to make it public. That was up to the students, what their privacy setting was, but they just did a spectacular job. And that was shared through Dr. Lowry's director's update. In terms of the outcomes, you can see that it was different for different students. So the blue bars are the freshmen, the yellow bars are the seniors. So you can see that in terms of freshmen, they were learning, it was new to them to express their political views. That's the one over, over here on the right. For the seniors, they were doing that a little bit more in class here. So that was less of a new thing for them, but it helped them connect with someone here. Um, and so, and overall, the scores were quite high. Um, so I was very pleased with how that turned out. Their takeaways, um, you can see them here on the screen. I wanna lift up just two, the first and the last. Um, one of the students said, I think it's easy to forget that two opinions or ideas on solutions to problems can be correct. Um, and so they were really able to hold and discuss the complexity of dealing with some of the public policy issues that we face. And then the other that I'll point out, because I think sometimes we might forget this, and that's the last comment that even though we are still in high school, our views can change significantly from even a few years ago to now. So many of them talked about what they used to believe in middle school and how that was already very different. Um, mindfulness, one of the ways I usually um, teach mindfulness here at the school is a unit in AP psychology. That was not possible this year because of the compressed time schedule. Um, so I found other ways to get this teaching out. Uh, there was a four session workshop in the winter time with students and parents. Um, so it was actually students and their moms. Um, and then during the One Small Step workshops, I taught a mindfulness activity, a technique at the beginning of each workshop. And I was surprised, um, pleasantly surprised when in the feedback that they gave to me, so many students lifted up those mindfulness exercises as things that had been really important to them in the workshop content. So that was really nice. So those are the different ways that the library has been engaging um, online with our students and broader community this year. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the foundation. It took till the end of the year for the kids to be able to use this, but this is the soft seating and the new stools that they um, funded for us that we got at the, over the summer and we're ready for the start of the new year. And so finally, here's Libby from Hanover. Um, finally, the kids were able to come in in March and start to use the seating and use our origami you know, paper and use the gratitude box and the other things physically in the library again. Um, and so that's just really awesome. So with that in mind, what questions do you have? Anything? Well, first, thank you so very much. Uh, board members, what questions or comments may you have? I know I've got a few, but I would rather hear from you first. Board members? I just Please, think that Mark. that's fantastic, all that you did uh, over a year um, that's to really engage engage the community. I mean, that's just monumental to, to achieve that in such a short time frame. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. And then for, for me, uh, first, thank you so very much. Uh, I think everything that Dr. Lowry said before you began to speak is all very true and more. Uh, we are so very lucky to have you uh, as a part of the team. And it's really clear that, you know, the creativity that had to be done to help people through with their community service and how they were doing things there, that was really fantastic. I, I loved how mindfulness was something that you could not only address on its own, but you introduced to the One Small Step program. And then of course, One Small Step, it, to me, is just a phenomenal program that, um, Frankly, I hope that 
that my school division steals. Uh, I mean, it's just such a great uh, uh, program and it seems so comprehensive. I, I understand the challenge that you've had with time and I look forward to what you'll be able to develop with an entire school year uh, with everybody in person and, and how much easier that'll make things. But I, I really just want to uh, thank you and congratulate you on such innovative uh, practices uh, in, in a really difficult time. Well, thank you. And it wouldn't be possible, though, without the support of the foundation and the administration and the board. Um, and also just, you know, our students are willing to try stuff, right? And our teachers are open to collaborating with me. As you guys might know from your own librarians, I mean, librarians only get to see whatever kids' teachers let them see, for the most part. And so my, you know, the teachers are open to these collaborations um, and are great partners in that. Um, so that that's all a piece of it. And I will say on one small step, um, it was covered in the in the paper recently, um, and I was thrilled that exactly what I hoped would happen by the fact that they covered in the paper happened yesterday. And that was that Meadowbrook High School in Chesterfield called me um, about bringing it to their school. And so I was able to tell them, you know, this is what I would do differently. This is what I did, shared with them, you know, video editions of all my workshops so they could take whatever they wanted from that. Um, and it was, and they're actually coming and meeting with me next week to kind of debrief and, and, and plan out um, for next year for themselves. So yes, I want you to steal it, um, Mr. Wright, please. Um, I think the more we can spread this program, the better. Um, what was true is that the materials that StoryCorps had created um, to support the program in schools were not adequate. Um, I don't know if they were even made by teachers. Um, and so working with them and showing them what I was doing, I hope is gonna also help them provide um, better materials to other schools. Um, so that they can they can make it work in their buildings. And there's lots of different ways to do it. So the way we do it isn't necessarily how it would work best anywhere else, but I think it can work in a lot of different schools. Um, so thank you for that and please steal away. You are a true servant leader, so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an update from the school advisory. Uh, committee, uh, and, and I see that, um, getting back to my thing, uh, I see that Mr. Larkin is on the call right now. Mike, do you need me to sh uh, give you screen sharing things or anything, or are you good? Uh, it really depends on whether everybody wants to actually see what I'm saying or just listen to what I'm saying. Uh, in any case, a copy has been provided, um, I think, in advance to everybody. So, well, I made you a co-house in case you decide to throw anything up there. You're welcome to do so, or you can just verbally walk us through it. I would screen share after after that wonderful presentation, though. Uh, I feel a little bit inadequate <laughs> having a bunch of words. Um, but uh, in any case, hopefully they're meaningful um, as, uh, as um, the last presentation. So it's my pleasure to provide this report on the activities of the Maggie Walker Governor School for Government and International Studies School Advisory Council for the 2021 year, uh, 2020 to 2021 year. I'm Michael Larkin. I'm the 2020 to 2021 chair of the SAC, and I'm a parent of a graduating senior today in the class of 2021, and have also been a resident of both Chesterfield County and the city of Richmond during my daughter's tenure at Maggie Walker. It's been an honor to serve on the SAC and in particular, contributing as a member of the Strategic Planning Committee in 2019 to 2020. I'm here today to provide you a summary of SAC's work during this past school year. So we had 16 representatives serving on SAC in the past year, including six parents representing various school districts, four students, three faculty and staff, one director's appointee, one gifted coordinator, Dr. Plevich, and one administrative representative. Now, despite the unprecedented challenges of this year, SAC remained focused on key goals and our agenda included both near-term and long-term objectives. The SAC also pivoted mid-year to reduce the time commitment for our volunteer members and to provide some much needed space for stress management. We also recognized the opportunity, opportunity to expand access to SAC through our virtual meeting format. The work of the SAC had both immediate impact 
and provided a foundation for meaningful contributions to strategic plan elements in the near future. This work was accomplished under the most challenging of circumstances, which speaks to the integrity and dedication of our SAC members. Now the work of the SAC falls into three categories, ad hoc advisory services, standing committees and special committees. So in the ad hoc advisory services uh, grouping, uh, we respond to requests from the director for recommendations or subject matter advisory assistance. There were two ad hoc advisory requests that were fulfilled by SAC during this past year. The first, Gabriella Watson and Madison Kang, students, served as panelists for the Virginia Secretary of Education's Forum on Governor School Admissions Policies in September 2020. And then secondly, a subset of SAC members led by Rachel Loving researched trade-offs related to removing numerical grades from official Maggie Walker transcripts and prepared a recommendation for the director. We have uh, three standing committees. First is the calendar committee. And you're very familiar with this. The calendar committee created the academic calendar for 2021 to 2022. And this process was informed by the previous year's academic calendar, as well as draft calendars posted by Maggie Walker's participating divisions. Three parents, one faculty member, one student, and one member of the planning committee contributed input. The committee was chaired by Max Smith, Maggie Walker Assistant Director, who is a valuable standing member of the SAC and will continue uh, next year as well. The standard start date calendar for 2021 to 2022 was submitted to the school board for first read in March and was adopted in April. Changes included additional religious observances in a step toward greater cultural inclusivity. The committee also completed an early start draft for 2022 to 2023, which models shifting the calendar start and end dates forward by two weeks for better alignment with APs, SOLs, and VHSL sports. The draft will be submitted for first review in June with anticipated adoption in August and communication will be extensive to students, parents, and faculty this summer. Nomination and bylaws committee. So the nominations committee accepted applications, conducted interviews, and held elections to replace the various openings to replace outgoing SAC members. This committee was chaired by Karen Townsend. There was a significant increase in interest, interest for serving on SAC and committee members conducted thorough interviews with parents and students. One of the more significant long-term accomplishments of this committee was to codify the processes so future SAC members will be able to leverage process templates in subsequent years. In the Policy and Handbook Review and Revisions Committee, there were no new handbook or policy revisions reviewed by SAC this year. Here are special committees. The SAC had several special committees this year, which were aligned to both short and longer term strategic plan objectives. So the first, removing structural barriers to student engagement. This committee was chaired by Rachel Loving and is also a key component of the 2020 to 2025 strategic plan. The objective of this group is to determine the elements which inhibit the participation of students particularly those who are members of upper underrepresented populations in educational and social activities at Maggie Walker. This team included representation from all constituencies on the SAC with significant contributions from students Gabriella Watson and Chase Gunlex. The committee facilitated the popular Black History Month assembly in February, which included a Maggie Walker house video, African American poetry, performed by the SLAM Poetry Club, and a keynote presentation from Faith Norell, a Maggie Walker family member. This team also prepared and executed a student survey related to the racial climate at Maggie Walker, the results of which were presented to the Regional School Board in May 2021. Campus life for, during COVID. This committee, co-chaired by student Gabriella Watson, and parent Rachel Gable was formed to address gaps in broad student engagement programs resulting from COVID restrictions. 
Addressing this gap with a sense of urgency, the committee worked with Max Smith, Paige Hawkins, SCA class officers, the PTSA, and the foundation to plan and execute several events which drew significant student participation and contributed to a sense of community during the first two quarters of the school year. Events included a drive-in movie, the Chalk Yoga Day, and a virtual game night. The committee's work was concluded in conjunction with the return to cap campus in March, 2021. The focus of this committee on countering the impacts of isolation and contribu contributing to the community culture were clearly demonstrated in the results. Maggie Walker's strategic marketing plan. So inspired by discussions during the 2020 to 2025 strategic plan development, this committee investigated factors which may be relevant to parent and student choice of Maggie Walker, including market perceptions and higher education selection. The committee was co-chaired by students Chase Gunlicks and Virginia Warren with guidance provided by parent Colleen Hall. This committee's work is seen as a multi-year effort with the work completed this year forming a foundation for ongoing efforts. A framework was proposed for additional research and prioritization of criteria for development into a concrete marketing plan in 2021 to 2022. Prospective students early engagement, also a component of the 2020 to 2025 strategic plan, this committee formed the approach to engage with elementary schools to provide awareness of Maggie Walker, access for interested parents and students, and the visible presence of role models in constituent communities. Given the limitations presented by COVID, the decision was made to delay tactical plans until restrictions were lifted. We expect that this committee will have a significant contribution in the next year as a carryover. And finally, SAC Marketing and Communications Plan. The purpose of this committee is to increase the awareness of SAC among students, parents, and alumni to provide transparency into the work of the SAC and engagement with constituent groups. One of the more significant accomplishments was to move SAC artifacts and document management onto Maggie Walker's SharePoint. This will ensure documents and sustainable processes will be established for future SAC members. And this committee will also be a carryover into the next year. So looking forward and in conclusion, three of our four executive committee members will be returning for 2021 to 2022 and have been reelected to their respective positions. The 2021 to 2022 SAC Executive Committee will be Michael Larkin, Chairperson, Ed Coleman, Vice Chair, Karen Townsend, Secretary, and Rachel Gable is our newly elected historian. The, ZAC, the SAC Executive Committee functioned exceptionally well as a team under difficult circumstances. And we believe the continuity of leadership will allow the SAC to provide even greater impact in the, the coming year. And on behalf of the entire SAC membership, thank you for the opportunity to serve Maggie Walker and its constituents. Thank you very much. That was a, a great report, very thorough. I think the, the probably the most complete SAC report I've ever uh, been a, a, in attendance for, certainly. There's a number of great things that were mentioned in your report. And if you don't mind, I've got one question for you. You mentioned early in your presentation that uh, you had an ad hoc committee that was looking into grades, the numerical values and that sort of thing. Uh, I assume that there's gonna be some output that, that maybe is already out there and I have not done my homework for, or maybe is still yet to come. I'm not honestly certain, um, but I'm very much looking forward to that. Did was there a great deal of uh, uh, variety in perspectives or, or uh, of what the proper outcome was there? Uh, so there were definitely some different perspectives and we actually landed on, and by the way, you, you did not miss anything. Uh, okay. <laughs> let you know. uh, the, uh, Dr. Loving actually sent me the recommendation um, uh, very early yesterday morning. I haven't had a chance to take a look at it um, but it's going to be forwarded on to Dr. Lowry as soon as um, I take a quick look at it. 
But uh, we agreed to um, in the SAC to recommend that the numerical grades actually are removed from the transcripts. But those students who wish to have some sort of explanation of numerical grades will work with counseling to have that communicated to the schools um, as they wish. So kind of an exception process. Right, great. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective and thank you for, for filling us in on that. I, I'm very interested in some of the things that you mentioned there in process templates. I think that's a great thing. And uh, in the end, how you sort of mentioned archiving all of your documents uh, through SharePoint. And I think those are things that really will serve the SAC for years to come. Uh, instead of starting over each year, <laughs> you get to truly start from where you la in last uh, left off. So I think that's going to be a great thing and a, a great, hopefully the implementation will lead to everything we hope. Thank you for that. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, COVID was a forcing mechanism for us was to have our, our all of SAC meetings on Zoom. And there are two things I think that are, are really interesting for opportunities. One is we are recording our SAC meetings. So mm -hmm. it provides the ability for people that are not able to attend, or if we wish to um, release this in the future to the general public, uh, that brings the transparency for what SAC is doing and the discussions that occur. Um, the second thing is that it actually provides, and this is, I know it's a small benefit, but it actually provides the ability for um, our recorder to go in and, and do minutes where they may miss some things uh, during the meetings. Yeah, and, and a reference point for you for years to come uh, or for committee members, perhaps you may not be there years from now, but uh, so, <laughs> so thank you very much for your leadership through this. Uh, board members, are there any other questions or comments? If not, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Lowry and thank you again, Mr. Larkin. Thank you. Really uh, happy to be continuing next year too. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Larkin, for that report. SAC has, has been an invaluable um, resource for the school this year. And I've, I've uh, got some ideas about some things in the future that SAC will be able to do for us as well. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Just a very quick update on the strategic implementation plan. Um, you know, as, as you can hear, we've been leveraging the plan, uh, not only through uh, things that the library is doing, but what SAC is doing. And we're excited about the opportunity this fall to now be able to start getting in person. There's a large chunk of our plan that deals with outreach and sort of imaging for us, which has been very challenging during COVID. But now we're going to be able to start doing that as well and really starting to implement some of the recommendations that came out from the racial climate survey that'll really support the welcoming uh, goal, that number one goal on the plan. So I anticipate a pretty significant um, update for us by I'd say November or so on some of the uh, initiatives that were, were created to support the objectives that we'll actually be able to start doing once we have everybody in place. So strategic plan is, is underway, we're still meeting uh, and SAC has been very helpful in, in being able to um, operationalize some of those goals on that plan. If there are no questions about that, I can move on to the consent items. No, please do. Consent items, the, the first set is the standard stuff that we always have. There is one item I'm gonna bring out that's a, a bit of a unique thing. Um, personnel, the personnel reports down at the bottom. Uh, we are one position away from being fully staffed. We're looking for a part-time orchestra teacher. Uh, and we still, we have interviews scheduled, so we're working through that, but we are uh, hired uh, a dynamite German teacher to replace uh, our German teacher who's going back to Germany, as well as uh, part-time Chinese uh, that we're in the process of, of wrapping that one up. We've, we've made the offer. We're just kind of going back and forth and making sure all the communications in place. But I feel pretty strong that, that we'll have that one taken care of. And all the other positions are filled. I, I plan on taking a little bit of time the first week of July. And my goal was when I stepped off campus to be fully staffed. And I think, knock on wood, I think we're just about there. So that's a good feeling. Uh, the financial reports are all uh, have been reviewed by the finance committee last week. Um, we're, we're in decent shape, budget versus obligations okay, transaction register and revenue, CARES transactions, we didn't leave any money on the table, so that's good. That brings us to the donation report, which is normally something I kind of just sort of breeze over, but something really unusual happened on Monday 
and I am bringing it to the board now because it was uh, surprising. And I'll tell you the story real quick, and then I'll click on the link and you can see it. So I checked my mail on Monday, and there's a little brown manila envelope with my name on it and a return address. And more often than not, that's, you know, some, it's usually not a positive thing, I guess is the best way of saying it. Uh, oftentimes, you know, the return address was a clue that there was actually something there because oftentimes they don't have return addresses and they're just anonymous suggestions on how I can do my job better. And that's always certainly appreciated. Um, or it's oftentimes invitations to attend uh, things in the community. And those are always kind of fun too. But this was a different one. And I opened it up and the first thing that I noticed was a check that was in the envelope. And I'm gonna click on this link now here so you can see what, I, what I'm dealing with here. And the check was for $100,000. And my first thought was, okay, it's either some sort of lottery scam, you know, I just, my, my cynic side of me just, just hit me hard. But then I read the other documents that were attached to it. And a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Rosenthal, who was a longtime Richmonder, um, and I did a little bit of research on this as I investigated this to see if this was actually real, because I, I, I didn't think it was. And a, a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Rosenthal, who was a longtime Richmonder, he was one of the founders of the standard drug stores that were common in Richmond. Uh, I think there were 50, 50 some drug stores before they sold out to CVS. And uh, Mr. Rosenthal was a, a, a silent philanthropist, I think is the way to put it. He um, spent you know, the latter part of his life, the last probably 20 or 30 years, essentially giving away his fortune. And he, he had made a lot of money, I believe. And this is all from his obituary, which is public knowledge. So I'm not sharing anything that you couldn't find. But he, he, he worked with other people in, in his uh, situation that had money. And they, they formed a group called the Silent Seven. And the Silent Seven would meet and find opportunities to make charitable donations to different organizations all around Richmond. And from what I could gather, he was the type of guy that didn't want his name attached to stuff. It wasn't looking to name something. He just wanted to help out his community that he loved. He was born in 1925 and he attended, the only connection I can find to Maggie Walker directly, and it's tenuous at best, is he attended TJ High School and graduated in the 1940s before going off and, and serving, um, actually, the, I'm sorry, the late 1930s before going off and serving uh, his country in the Navy during the Second World War. And uh, he's, he's made some small donations to the foundation before. We, we were able to track that down. I suspect that he probably had a relative that attended here uh, at some point in time. And maybe that's what got us onto his radar. But attached to the check was a copy of his will or, or part of his will that dealt with a trust that he had set up in the late 1990s. And part of the trust indicated that if his wife were to... Uh, to, to pass away before him, there was a mechanism that kicked in to where several charitable donations would be made. And one of them was to the Maggie L. Walker Governor's School in the amount of $100,000. And I, I, in the process of contacting the executor to get a little bit more details, but because of the fact that the donation needs to be accepted by the board, uh, I wanted to try and get it in quickly because otherwise I would have to hang on to this thing until August and that's a long time to hang on to a check. So it is safely in our safe right now and has been for a couple of days, but by every indication that I can see, this is absolutely legitimate being donated with no strings attached uh, with the best of intentions from a longtime Richmond resident who over the course of his life, sees a value in Maggie L. Walker Governor's School, and there is a check for one hundred thousand um, dollars. And again, we uh, Barbara took the quote there, the quote that had the uh, statement from that came with it. Our parents loved the community they called home for their entire lives. They consistently gave of their time and resources to many organizations that helped build and make Richmond a wonderful place. Upon the death of the second one, they directed that another round of charitable gifts be made. And then this check is in satisfaction of the charitable gift provided under that trust. And I have all the legal documentation that goes with that. So it's, it's legit. So my recommendation following policy of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of Maggie L. Walker Governor School is to accept this uh, check. And then what we'll do is we'll just put it, just put it in a donation account. We'll leave it there for now. I'd like some time to be able to communicate with the family and find out if maybe they had any particular 
passions or interests. I, I don't want to just use it to buy, you know, floor wax and toilet paper. I, I'd like to see if there's a way that maybe we could direct this a little bit, uh, at least in the general direction of what this family might have felt. But they very well may say, you know, he, he, he would have trusted you to make the decisions, in which case we can talk about it later. But the first order of business is to actually formally accept the donation. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn that wonderful bit of news back over to you. Well, thank you very much. What a wonderful surprise. Uh, and I believe you said this was un unrestricted or at least not yet indicated any restriction. That is, that is correct. It is unrestricted. That That is fantastic. And I applaud the um, slow approach <laughs> to make any decision making about what to do with these things. This is really a wonderful outcome. Um, Dr. Lowry, do you think that there is a need for any sort of, um, uh, is, is there a need for any sort of action item related to this? I mean, we're, we're accepting these dollars and I assume this was written to the foundation, which technically- uh, it, was, it was not, otherwise I would be letting them deal with this. It was written specifically to the Maggie L. Walker Governor School. Um, I see. So what I can do is contact and so we need to we need to get it into our accounts. The first piece. Yeah. What I can do is contact the executor of the estate of the trust, and if he says, "Oh yeah, my dad always donated to the foundation," well then we'll know that maybe that's the appropriate place to channel that, and that's absolutely a benefit to school if that's what the family wanted. But by all the legal documentation that I can see, there is no mention of the foundation in it, um, both in the trust as well as the letter as well as. Uh, the receipt that I'm supposed to send back to them, none of it mentions foundation. So I think for us, it's, uh, I think it's our, you know, our, our responsibility to figure out what to do with it. And, and certainly, uh, like you said, the deliberate approach as to the best way of doing it. You know, one of the, like you say, one of the challenges with school money is that there, it has to be spent certain ways. Even if it's unrestricted, there's still some, I've got more rules that I need to follow than say the PTSA or the foundation. So it may right. be that the decision is made down the road that it would benefit the school in a more broad sense to, to do it a little bit differently. But at least in the immediate, the immediate point is that we need to get this check out of the safe and into, into a bank account where it uh, will be secured. Right, okay. Well, uh, so I'm not hearing that we need to have any sort of action item. And I don't honestly think as I'm sort of running through it, that it would be an action item for you to be able to accept. Uh, it's just, these, it's just um, a consent. It's a consent item of just accept, right. you know, and I, I think the policy is written that, yeah. you know, if we were, if we received a donation from say an organization that had values that were counter to what the values of our school would be, we wouldn't want to accept that money. And I think that's why that policy is in there, but by every good faith, effort that I've made, and Wendy has put a couple things uh, in the chat there. This yeah. this looks like a well-intentioned, extraordinarily yeah. generous gift yeah. that was a wonderful surprise to have, uh, you know, find in your mailbox. I'm sorry, Michael put the, uh, Michael put the, I just saw, there we go, yeah, I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to disrespect you like that, but, you know, being being in the same class as Wendy DeGroote is not a bad deal, so sorry about that. So I think it's just a matter of you can just take all these items into consent together. But I just wanted to draw that attention because that's not the usual $25 donation to the robotics team that we usually get. Perfect. Well, then thank you for the discussion around that. I just wanted to take the time and make sure that we were doing everything properly. So board members, we've got an entire consent agenda essentially in front of us, four different items here. Uh, if, is there any comments or questions? And if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I saw Ms. Heislip first. So we'll take her. Everybody, thank you so much for your participation. I love that. Uh, so board members, we've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. So that'll carry us through the consent agenda and brings us to our action items. Uh, Dr. Lowry, we've got just a couple of items. Just here. a couple of action items, Mr. Chairman. The first one is the textbook adoption. Um, and the budget of money is there in red. Everything has been taken care of. It's just updating. Nothing, nothing controversial or shocking. Just updating required textbooks for um, 
math, science, our seminars, um, books that we want to be able to purchase for our students. And I'm just kind of scrolling through them. Mathematics needed new calculus books, AP science, some of the lit books, fine arts. But everything comes into um, everything comes into line with our approved budget. So no, nothing required there beyond just the approval of the board to go ahead and adopt the textbooks. Okay, great, thank you. And then, uh, let's see, board members, are there any questions or comments in relation to the textbook adoptions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you. We've got a motion uh, from Ms. Hall, I believe. No. No? Uh, I'm sorry. I can't get everybody on the camera at the same time. I'm sorry. I don't know who made the motion. Uh, I made the motion. Hi, Slip. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Heislip. <laughs> Do we have a second? Ms. Hall, could second. I volunteer you? Thank you. Yes, yeah, second. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> Board members, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you once again. And then that brings us to our uh, assignment of reserve funds. Yep, this is sort of a technical thing that's required by policy. Um, but uh, it's reported here, the, the general balance, that's the, the big money that's kept in the city of Richmond. As of June 30th, we are gonna project it to be about 1.327892 and three cents uh, in terms of that figure. And the capital improvement balance is down to zero. So we propose by policy, we're required to do this, but that the carryover from the 20, fiscal year 21 into 22, we're estimating it's gonna be about $200,000. So we'll move that money into the capital improvement fund, um, which will leave uh, 1127000 in the general fund overall. And we should actually, and Mr. Wright, I know you'd be happy to hear this. I've been told, of course, we've been told this before, that we should have some audits, uh, completed audits to be able to present to you or at least get to you over the course of the summer. And we can vote on acceptance in August. But my understanding is that they have everything now. And that should bring us up to closer to current than where we are. Fantastic news. I will uh, reserve. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> I will not be holding my breath. But no, thanks. no, no. I would not recommend that for anybody, but uh, <laughs> allegedly we are we are on the process. So I guess the bottom line is we think that these numbers in the reserve, the general fund reserve is, is are, are pretty close to that. So uh, Dr. Lowry, obviously, uh, we are projecting something for for a balance that's two weeks from now. Are we including that hundred thousand dollar check, for instance? We are not. We are not because this was done prior to that. I did not include that in the general fund. Okay. Um, is do you see a need for us to come back and have further action in the future? I, I think what I would do uh, the the smart thing I think would be in August we take a look at this again and see, you know, again, what we're projecting, I, I can't imagine in the next 13 days that these numbers are gonna move dramatically, but you, you never right. know. Right. Um, and then plus with the audit, if the audit comes back and we find out that the fund balance is not what we think it is, because the last time they audited it, um, it went up quite a bit. Right. Yeah. So I would say that we would wanna push an agenda item on to the August full board meeting to review uh, maybe just a complete financial picture of where we are in terms yeah. of capital improvement and general fund and, and what our projections are. And by August, we should have solid numbers on fiscal year 21 right. in terms of where we landed. And yeah. we should have a pretty good view as to where we're going moving forward. So I would, I would make that recommendation just to, to come back and visit this. And then hopefully by August, we'll have, a, well, we will absolutely have a lot more information perhaps as to what to do with the donation that we received as well. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that clarification. Board members, uh, I think that's probably setting up the subject is, uh, do we have a uh, motion to approve? I'll make a motion that we approve the FY21 assignment of reserve funds. Thank you, Mr. Pritchett. And I saw Ms. Barber's hand up for, I I'll assume, second. a second. Thank you so very much. 
So board members, we've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, great. I think we've got this uh, also. So that takes us takes care of our action items and brings us down to items for board review, Dr. Lowry. Correct. All, almost all of these are just technical items that we really don't need to go too far into, but the annual authorization of the DOE signatures, the certification, the crisis manual, the student handbook, those are all just first reads so that we can approve these by the deadlines in August. I do not anticipate at this time anything changing in the student handbook that's of any radical nature. So the student handbook that we have this year will just be updated with new bell schedules and dates and stuff since the current handbook is, uh, you know, it's got a lot of COVID stuff in there. So we'll, we'll clean all that up and get that up to back where do we need. There are a couple items though that I do want to highlight just a little bit. Uh, one of them is the academic 2022-23 calendar. And this is recommending from the calendar committee in SAC an early start, or it's really not so much early start anymore because everybody, you know, the majority of our districts are doing this, but an, a, pre, a pre Labor Day start uh, to the fall of 2022. So not this year, but next year, we would like to have this out as a first read. And uh, it has been communicated to our population, but we'll continue to, to communicate that to our population if there's any feedback that they want to have between now and August. But we do want to start, the, like I said, the majority of our districts are now doing a pre-Labor Day start and to make things easier on transportation for everybody, we would like to be able to match that up. So. Um, that's one item I just wanted to highlight. And then um, the other item, well, there's actually two items here, but one of them is just kind of a technical thing. The September school board meeting, which would be the executive board, this board, this group right here, is scheduled to meet on the 16th of September. That is Rosh Hashanah, and our school calendar has us closed on that day. So we need to review and decide by August. We don't need to do it now but that we will want to move that board date. We can either push it up a week, back a week, or move it earlier in the week. Um, but the 16th of September is, is a date that we probably should not have the regional board meeting. So I'm just kind of putting that out there and maybe Barbara can help me with a Google poll or something and pull the executive committee and just sort of see what, because I know many of you have set meetings on certain dates, so we don't want to drop something where, where that would take place. So just kind of putting that out there. And then the only other item I think that's kind of noteworthy is we are bringing back an international travel proposal that our French teacher has developed where we would actually do an exchange with a school in France um, where we would go there for a couple of weeks and then they would come here for a couple of weeks. That's something that, that used to be done pretty regularly at Maggie Walker, but kind of sort of faded out a little bit. And we would really like to try to bring that back. But this is all of course, assuming that it's safe to travel, that France is open, that we're open, uh, and that we're in a position to be able to do that. Um, she's uh, estimating a maximum number of students of being 22. It, it will likely be a little bit less than that. Um, and the estimated cost is listed at the bottom there. It's about $2,600 uh, on the high end per student if we're able to do this. So she wanted to just get preliminary, preliminary, you know, the, the word out there to everybody so that we could start to do a little bit of planning for it. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity. It goes very well with our mission. Um, and it's something that we haven't done quite in, in quite a while to be able to host some students here as well as take some students over there. So that's just an item out there as a first read just to, to take a look at it. And again, we'll, we can certainly discuss it robustly in uh, August and maybe by then we'll have a better idea as to what the world situation is like in terms of the safety of being able to travel. Um, but I am, I am optimistic that we'll be able to do something like that. So those are all the items for the first read. And if it's okay with you, Mr. Chairman, well, are there any questions? No, but I do want to acknowledge all the work that uh, Mrs. Marshall has done in putting together the policy and regulation updates. <coughs> there, there is an extensive uh, number, I believe it was 65, if I remember correctly. It's about right. Uh, different policies that had essentially grammatical or reference changes. Uh, and she's taken an enormous amount of time to go through and weed those out, separate them from the rest of the herd, and believe me, it is a herd, and uh, present them for us so that we can take care of these in time and have a second reading in August. So I just want to acknowledge all of that work that she's done. I would absolutely second that acknowledgement, uh, especially on these ones where you're looking at punctuation changes in code 
numbers. Uh, it is dry, not exciting work, but it's, it's, it's important. And she keeps us online on that. Yes, and she definitely does. So thank you then that, that um, board members would conclude all of our items for board review and discussion. We've got a few information items there, Dr. Lowry. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, I'll just present them as a group. Uh, the finance committee meetings uh, minutes are there. The article that Mr. Grote was talking about is there, a link there. For those of you, and I know that um, as Barbara, Mr. Wright, you've had seniors here. Senior showcase is a pretty big deal and we did it virtually this year. So the link to all of the presentations is there for anyone that would like to look at some of their kids and what they did. Um, we had a senior art expo exposition and there's some links to the CBS reports. Uh, we actually held an in-person prom uh, on June 5th and it was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm not sure if there's a picture. Yeah, there is. Um, just was fantastic. And we did it out in the front parking lot with a huge tent. You know, it looks like something you would see at the Folk Festival. And about 340 some kids came and it was a little on the hot side, but that was okay. And they all had a wonderful time danced all night long uh, or well, until 10 o'clock till the noise order and ordinance kicked in and we had to we had to shut it down but they um they had a wonderful time and so that was that's something i just kind of highlight and then the rest of the items there are just uh awards and things that we've received uh we, i talked about the film festival and showed you the trophy and the state runners up for tennis uh, and i'm sure we'll have some information on track as well because they're they're pretty strong as well so a lot of information there you know and again i'll just i'll close out my section just by saying it, it was a challenging year, but everybody stepped up and I think we honestly did the best we could do given the information that we had at the time to be able to work through things. You know, hindsight 2020, and there's some things I certainly wish I'd have done a little bit differently. But at the time, you know, we we didn't we didn't know anything before anybody else did. And that and that made uh, some of the decision making process kind of tough. But the flexibility of the board, the flexibility of the, the staff and the kids and the families and the parents and the community. Um, we got through it, I think. I mean, I think we're mostly through it now. And all things considered, we, we did fairly well. We had record number of, in, of uh, eighth graders apply to attend our school, over 1,400 of them applied to attend Maggie Walker. So we, even in the, the, an era of limited communication, we were still able to get the word out about the school to an extent to get that kind of number. So I am I am very optimistic about uh, where we're headed and what we're gonna see over the next school year. And if I can just get these seniors out of here today and the, the rest of everybody out by by the end of next week, uh, we can start focusing on on that, that, that school opening and, and sort of the rebirth, so to speak. So thank you for all your support and I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman, I believe. You are at home stretch. Thank you very much, Dr. Lowry. I, I uh, would like to echo your comments about the year, uh, how we faced and overcame the challenges that were presented to us. I do think that uh, we have much to be proud of as you've illustrated throughout the agenda today and, and uh, honestly at every meeting that we have. So uh, congratulations to the class of 2021. We will see them a little later this afternoon. Uh, and so that's that's it for my comments. I don't know of any other announcements that we need, which- Mr. Members... Chairman, oh, would yes. you mind if I uh, uh, gave you a piece of information? Please when the board do. comes back for the August meeting, you'll have two new divisions. Oh, Both that's new correct. Heights and Dinwiddie will be joining you in August. That is correct. Fantastic. Looking forward to making new friends and learning from uh, different perspectives than the ones we already have in front of us. Uh, so then board members, that brings me to my favorite agenda item. Would anyone care to uh, make a motion to adjourn? Uh, this is Sarah Barber. I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Uh, so board members, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 I hope that all of you uh, are able to celebrate Juneteenth uh, that's coming up this weekend. And we'll look forward to seeing you in August at the full board meeting. Thanks one and all.